Aptas Online Sunday Service. Uh, firstly, if you're new here today, we'd like to give you a warm welcome. Uh, stick around. Uh, hopefully, you like what you see. Secondly, if you're somebody who's already a part of this community, we hope you're getting used to this whole uh, online church thingy. Um, you know, and, and that is becoming a little bit more natural to you. Uh, little by little. I know for a lot of you, you actually are really enjoying this. Um, I know uh, that that uh, some of you, I can tell, haven't uh, even had a, taken a shower this Sunday morning. You're sitting there in your jammies with your coffee mugs, just chilling. Uh, but but seriously, I, I think God doesn't judge you, and and hopefully we don't either, right? Uh, uh, okay. What's the plan for today? Uh, firstly, we should take some time uh, and really engage with worship uh, this is where we single-mindedly fix our eyes our sights you know uh, everything that's going on inside our minds in the busyness of the city and focus uh, on God on, on Jesus um, we should be doing this through the medium of songs lyrics and and melodies uh, next we are going to hear from uh, God's Word what does God really have to say to us uh, this is what we call the sermon and finally Today we should be engaging with a time of prayer and communion with our respective small groups. So if they haven't reached out to you, to you yet with the Zoom link, uh, do contact them. Um, so with that being said, uh, let's just jump into a time of worship. Over to Dennis and the team. Hey, welcome back. My name is Dennis and I'll be leading us in a time of worship with our fantastic band that's going to be playing along. Uh, so let me open with with this thought. You know, in the Bible, uh, the Bible speaks of God making this this uh, this beautiful earth that's so pure and wholesome, and uh, and then sin enters through one man and just throws everything off course. You know, it, it just throws our planet into this this um, downward spiral of of just unrest and chaos and and uh, and self destruction. Uh, well, the Bible then goes on to speak of of God sending His only Son, Jesus. And uh, Jesus comes to fix our broken systems. He comes to fix our broken spirit and ultimately our broken hearts, you know. Uh, that which was meant to be a beautiful construction and which is broken down, Jesus comes to rebuild that in our lives. Uh, and uh, in in its complete sense, you know, one day, Jesus will take this broken world and rebuild it into a beautiful place. That's his assurance. That's his promise that he'll turn this into a place where there's no more tears. There's no more pain. There's no more suffering. There's no more loss. And, and, and that's the role of Christ in our lives. You know? So as we spend the next few moments uh, worshiping, uh, worshiping God through music uh, and then listening to a sermon, I just want to invite you to, uh, to just come to a space a space of introspection if you can uh, just go deep down into your heart and uh, just come face to face with with your deepest fears and your deepest anxieties and uh, won't you just invite Lord Jesus to, to come inside your heart and and just rebuild those broken places so come let us pray Lord Jesus we thank you for this day we thank you that uh, you are here to fix this world. You are here to fix our lives and fix our hearts and, and things that we can't really change, Father. You step down and you change those things in our world. Lord Jesus, we invite you in our hearts today, this morning. We invite you to come and fix every broken foundation, every broken emotion in our heart, Lord. We invite you to come and fix it, Lord. Every heartbreak, every hurt, Every feeling of being let down by this world and by our loved ones and by uh, our uh, lack of achievement in life, we just ask you to step down and, and rebuild it. We invite you. And Father, we ask you to, to receive our offering of prayer and worship and adoration as we bring it up to you today. Be glorified in this place. Be glorified in our homes. Thank you, Lord. We ask for your shalom peace to enter our hearts and our minds and our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Far 
farthest edge there in the silence you were there my faith was torn to shreds and my heart in the balance but you were there
casting out fear And even when I'm caught in the middle of the storms of this life I won't turn back, I know you are near And I will fear no For my God is with me And if my God is with me Whom then shall I fear? Whom then shall I fear? Oh no, you never let go Through the calm and through the storm Has made a way 
Lord Jesus, we just want to exalt your name this morning together. We want to declare that you are worthy. There is no one like you, King Jesus. We thank you for the blood that you shed for us, Lord. Thank you for the promise of restoration that you have given us, O Lord. Lord, we give you our hearts this morning. We invite you into our hearts. Come and rebuild all that is broken. Restore all that is stolen, Lord. We give you all our adoration today, Lord. We give you all our praise, all our worship. We ask you to come and speak to us, Lord, as we spend the rest of the this, this morning hearing your word. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for who you are. And thank you for what you've done for us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, hopefully that was a really meaningful and engaging time of worship. So now we're going to transition to uh, the sermon. Last week we began a new sermon series called After the Storm, um, right? This is an exploration of the prophetic books from the Old Testament. Uh, we will take a look at the books of Haggai, Zechariah, and uh, Malachi, right? Um, and these books were written after the Jews went through a particularly tough time, you know, a crisis time, just like we uh, today in Mumbai are going through one ourselves um, uh, so they are coming out of exile and, and, and in these, these books the, the prophets explore the questions of what it really means to rebuild, to re-envision our life uh, and uh, these books essentially call us to remember of what is of great value you know uh, and, and it, they give us a call to trust in God uh, who is always on our side and who will come through for us fully um, and ultimately gives us a call to reorient ourselves to the future right and to really dwell on that hope so uh, Addie began the sermon series last week uh, in the first chapter of Haggai and Jim and today shall continue and end the book of Haggai in chapter 2 and this is the basic premise of of his sermon today which is uh, as we begin to process this whole reintegration uh, you know what does it really look like uh, and the fact is that we will all need courage to face uh, the challenges that will arise uh, so how does God give us courage to face our fears uh, we should look to Jimit and hear from him a bit more thank you worship team and Ashwin for leading us through that time how is everyone doing I'm assuming a, a mix of emotions. Uh, some of us are feeling a little bit of relief, uh, a little bit of movement. We can probably go back to doing certain things. Some of us are feeling a little nervous as to what this reopening and lockdown 5.0 looks like. Others of us may have these fears and anxieties, uh, worried about the second wave and, and what the ramifications of that look like. Is, is our medical infrastructure geared to handle another wave? And in the midst of all of this, you know, we as a church are embarking on a journey to explore the, the books of Haggai, Zechariah and Malachi. You see, there are a lot of similarities between what the Israelites were going through and what we are going through. They were in exile uh, around, uh, starting around 586 BC and now they are reintegrating back as, as the king allows them to. And as they are reintegrating back, they are now facing... Uh, new challenges, new situations that they've not had before and they've had to navigate around them. There are a lot of principles that we can learn from as we see the prophetic voices of Haggai, Malachi and Zechariah speaking to the challenges uh, that the people of Israel faced and learn from it today. You know, God in His mercy sent prophets, kings, administrators, priests to help them deal as they reintegrated back into the new normal. Uh, the book of Haggai, although is known as a minor prophet, he actually had a very, very major message. They're known as minor prophets, not uh, necessarily to do with their message, but to the length uh, of the books. And here is Haggai, 
that giving the Israelites a very, very major message. And we pick up from uh, chapter 2, uh, where I.D. left us at after he covered chapter 1. We're going to read a portion of chapter 2. It's going to appear on your screen. Haggai 2, verses 1 to verses 9. On the 20th day of the, of the seventh month, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Haggai. Speak to Zerubbabel, son of Sheatel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Zodak, the high priest, and to the remnant of the people. Ask them, who is it, who, who of you is left who saw this house in its former glory? How does it look to you now? Does it not seem like nothing? Be strong, Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, Joshua, son of Zodak, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord, and work. For I am with you, declares the Lord Almighty. This is what I have covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt. And my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. This is what the Lord Almighty says. In a little while, I will once more shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. I will shake all the nations and what is desired by all nations will come. I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord Almighty. The silver is mine. The gold is mine, declares the Lord Almighty. The glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house, says the Lord Almighty. And in this place I will grant peace, declares the Lord Almighty. See what God's doing? He is encouraging this people. He, he reminds them to not fear. Be strong. Be courageous. And as we explore this, this message that God's giving his people, he's encouraging them and he, he's He's speaking directly to their insecurities. As we do that, we're going to explore two things today. Number one, the difficulty of finding courage. And number two, the possibility of finding courage. Let's begin. And this is going to be my main point today. Although the road towards reintegration is full of challenges, God gives us courage through His presence and His providence. The road ahead is full of challenges, but through God's courage, it is possible to face whatever it is that we are going to face, be faced with. Let's begin point number one, the difficulty of finding courage. So when you think of courage right now, what comes to your mind? Uh, maybe you are thinking of uh, images of bravado, men and uh, women with, with uh, strength that they have displayed, overcame great odds, fought great wars. Uh, the Hebrew word that uh, comes here, when God tells them to be strong, is the word Kazakh. It appears actually 266 times in the Bible. And what it actually means is to be strengthened. And it, often it's translated as courage, it's translated as strength. But what it means is uh, a force, uh, an ongoing journey of getting strengthened or becoming someone. It's not something that we uh, just immediately achieve. It's not just an emotion alone. Courage doesn't mean the absence of challenges or absence of fear. In fact, if you speak to anyone who's displayed courage, I uh, will tell you that it's not that they didn't have fears, it's not that they didn't have anxieties or challenges, but how they worked through their challenges, how they worked through their fears, how they were being strengthened. There was a force that helped them overcome their fears. And it's important to keep that in mind because in our culture, when we think of courage, uh, we often have certain imageries that we gravitate towards. But the biblical idea of courage is a force, a, a strengthening, a growing into and becoming someone who is able to work through their fears, work through their challenges. What are the fears that you have today as you are thinking of reintegrating back? What do you think that the fears that the Israelites had as they think about courage? You know, I heard a, a joke once. Uh, there were three uh, so, uh, soldiers, three commanders, and as they were, they were sort of having a drink together, and they were all talking about how courageous they are. So, uh, as they were having a conversation, one of the generals said, you know, I'll tell you what courage is. So he called one of his soldiers, and uh, they were in a very freezing environment, uh, and uh, they, he said, hey, uh, jump into this freezing lake, take one round, and come back. So the soldier says, yes, sir, and he, he jumps into that freezing lake, takes one round and he comes back to so the first commander says see guys this is courage the second one says I'll tell you what is courage uh, he calls one of his uh, soldiers says hey jump into this freezing lake and take seven rounds and come back 
so the soldier obliges, he jumps into the freezing lake, shivering, he, he takes seven rounds, he comes back and the second uh, commander looks at uh, two of his officers and says, this is what courage is. The third commander puts his uh, whiskey glass down and he, uh, he says, guys, I'll tell you what courage is. He calls his soldier and he says, uh, jump into this lake, take ten rounds and come back. His soldier looks at him and says, are you crazy? Why do you want me to jump into this freezing lake? I'm not going to do that. I'm not a crazy person. The general uh, commander looks at his other two friends and he says, this is true courage. You know, the point is that courage is a lot more than just uh, mere emotion or just showing bravado. Uh, there is an inner resolve that God wants to build in us, an inner strength that is able to overcome challenges. So, what are the fears that the Israelites had? And what are the postures that they had that kept them from operating from a place of strength and courage? And why did God need to encourage them? We're going to look at two specific postures from the text that they had that God was speaking into. Number one, they were too focused on the past. In verse 3, God asked them, Who of you is left who saw the house in its former glory? How does it look to you now? Does it not seem to you like nothing? See what God is saying? They are thinking it's never going to be as good as the good old days. You know, it's never going to The past was so much more glorious than the present. The good old days were holding them back. Let's, before we get into this, let's trace how they got here. You see, last week we saw that people were reintegrating back and basically they, they forgot their priorities. They started building their own houses, uh, often from a legitimate place of fear. They didn't know if they had enough resources, they didn't know if they had enough uh, finances to, to build God's house. They were not sure who gave the commandment. But we also saw the governor's house was quite luxuriously built. And Haggai comes and he warns them, he reprimands them. He says, don't forget your priorities, guys. Remember God's house. And don't behave uh, like your ancestors did, the very reason that uh, they were taken into exile. Remember God, remember the priorities. Thankfully people complied and they started uh, rebuilding uh, the house and they started putting in their hands the plough. Just two or three weeks later, God comes back. And that makes you think, uh, what? They started something and in three to four weeks, uh, God has to come back and re-motivate them. You know, why did God have to come back three to four weeks later? What warranted another encouragement from God just a short time? In just, uh, just a short time. Kind of reminds me of New Year's resolutions, right? Whether you, you think of uh, getting fit, exercising, you know, you do it for a few weeks, for some of us a few days, and we need another resolution to go ahead with our resolution that we passed. Or maybe if some of us decided, just like the people in the book of Haggai, to get right with God, we made the resolution to, to, to follow God's heart and dig deeper into God's word. And just a few days later, we lose motivation and we need another encouragement. And maybe that's what's happening. You know, it, uh, but see what, what, what Haggai is telling them. He's saying, uh, who of you is, is left who saw this house in its former glory? You see, around 66 years ago, Nebuchadnezzar, who is uh, a one of, one of the kings of the Chaldean dynasty, he, he conquered Syria, Palestine and he's the one who took the people of uh, Israel into Babylon as exiles, as slaves and he is the one who desecrated the temple at Jerusalem. Around 66 years they lived there, then a, a Persian king who eventually uh, was ruling, he was favorable towards the Israelites and he sent them back. 66 years have gone by, not many of them who saw Solomon's temple uh, the temple that was existing before the exile are alive today. Some of them, as they go back, they begin to reminisce about the good old days. You see, Solomon Temple, uh, according to 1 Kings 9.10, took around 7 years to build. Okay, It had around 3,000 tons of gold, it had 30,000 tons of silver, and it, was, it had been made from special, uh, special wood and other artifacts, and Nebuchadnezzar had come desecrated all of that. So as these people uh, respond to Haggai's rep reprimand and they begin to build this temple, there are some of them who remember the good old days and the old temple and its glory and are maybe feeling a little discouraged. You know? 
and there are some younger folks who are who don't who don't know uh, that era era and they have some kind of motivation as uh, God's convicted them through a Haggai. Now these older folks probably begin to influence some of these uh, younger men and women who are helping and they too started feeling a little demotivated. You know, even as we think about going back to our old lives, you know, we could be tempted to just focus back on the good old days. And don't get me wrong, there's nothing wrong in actually thinking about the past. In fact, in scripture we are often told, remember God's goodness, remember the past. But whenever we are told to remember the past, we are always told to remember how God was with us in the past, how He rescued us against seemingly odds that were stacked, stacked up against us, how He saved us from the powers of darkness, how He came through for us when, when nothing was working in our favor, how He made beauty from ashes. So whenever we are told to remember the past, we are encouraged to remember with, with God's heart, with redemption in our minds. But if we think about the past and we just sort of dwell on it too much, we just think about how things are never going to be as good in the past, and we start comparing our present situation to the past without God's redemptive lens, it can begin to overwhelm us and begin to discourage us. What are some of the things that you're missing about the past? As you reintegrate back uh, and you, you will see limitations to the things you're doing, only one person is allowed in the office, you will miss your friend, you will miss miss the lunch time where all of you were gathered together sharing your tiffin and it will be some time before things go back to normal you know some of them some of us will have financial challenges and things won't always look the same but here is what we're called to remember the same God who rescued us in the past who came through us in the past is the same one who's now going to help us rebuild and reintegrate us back into the plans that he has for us the same God who rescued us is going to help us overcome this discouragement. It takes courage, friends, to, to move past the pain of the past. It takes courage to, to step into the future. It takes courage to see the past through redemptive lenses. And again, uh, I'm not suggesting that you don't need to work through some of the pain, some of the issues that you've had in the past. I'm not suggesting that. All I'm saying is, could unhealthily dwell in the past and that can keep us discouraged and keep us in this place where we are not operating from a place of strength and that's why God is coming and telling them, hey do you remember the temple in his former glory? Take heart for I am with you. So that's the first posture God is confronting but there's another posture he's confronting. We could be too worried about the future. Stepping into the unknown, stepping into the new normal, it's actually one of the scariest things we could do. There are all kinds of questions that come and God is directly speaking to it right now. So see what he says in verse 5. This is what I have covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt. Why does Haggai mention the Israelites' journey from Egypt to the promised land? Many of you may be familiar with the story, you know, they, the Israelites were as bonded slaves in Egypt and God through some insane miracles delivers them from slavery and he takes them towards the promised land and there was this in-between phase where they were delivered through some crazy miracles that happened and they walked through the wilderness into the promised land you see even as, as they walked through the wilderness they had to walk with God in the unknown they didn't know where their next meal is going to come from they, they had practical challenges about housing and all kinds of uncertainties that, that were overwhelming their minds. In fact, we read that as they began to journey in the wilderness, they began to have doubts about God. Many of them started preferring slavery in Egypt, although they saw the hand of God at work miraculously, they began to prefer slavery in Egypt rather than walk with the God in the unknown who came through for them without fail, came through for them daily into the promised land. And if we get too caught up in the past, we can sort of get discouraged. But if we get too worried about the future, we can feel crippled with anxiety and fear. And God is drawing this parallel to, to remind the 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 current group of exiles that have come from uh, Babylon into, uh, into Israel and he's reminding them 
that don't you know what I did with the Israelites? Did you see how I walked with them? And yes, as you are here, you're going to face new challenges. You will have questions like they had. We have questions today, right? Like, where are we going to get our finances from? You know, the, the jobs that we, we used to have in the new normal, are my gifts and talents going to be utilized? Do I have to modify myself? Uh, whenever, whenever we will do meet some of my friends and families, you know, many of us uh, are separated from our loved ones. All kinds of questions exist in our minds today as we think of reintegrating back and questions existed in the minds of the Israelites as they began to rebuild the temple back. You know, and even as they had this, those questions, you know, if they dwell too much on the anxiety of the future and the unknowns of the future, that fear can cripple us. As fallen creatures, as, as creatures who are broken, we find it very difficult to trust God and we find it very difficult to walk in the unknown. We very much want control of our environment. If we don't know everything clearly and many of us love our Excel sheets and our checklists, we love just doing what we know and find it difficult to walk with God in the unknown. You know, growing up, I've always had the fear of uh, an ocean or a sea. And I always didn't, I didn't fully understand why I had this fear. Uh, but the, as I grew older, I realized that the reason I feared the ocean, uh, the sea, is because I didn't know what was on the, the bed or the seabed. I didn't know what I was putting my uh, foot in. Especially if I couldn't see, I was very scared. And uh, it's only later on that I began to process it. So I didn't necessarily have the fear of heights. But every time I would go uh, on a trek or, or just uh, with my friends, and I've had to jump off a cliff or jump off some small ridge. I always get scared. Uh, I didn't know uh, what was beneath uh, in the water. And as you see in this picture, you know, I stood. It was not a, a long cliff as you see. But uh, I stood there for nearly 15 minutes before I jumped. Not because I have the fear of heights. But because as I looked down, I saw a school of uh, slightly largest fish uh, roaming around. As I was roaming around, I was just worried if I can see that. How much more that's underneath that I can't see. But thankfully, just like uh, other times that I've uh, learned to do this, I have always sensed God and His presence close to me, especially as I've uh, you know, either kayaked in the ocean or I've jumped on the cliff, which I did end up jumping, by the way. Because God's presence reminds me that I can walk with Him in the unknown. I can trust Him in the unknown. You, that, that's exactly what God is saying here. He says, do you remember what I did as I took you out of slavery into the promised land? He's directly speaking into their insecurities. Be strong, be courageous. If you think you've heard this before in the Bible or you've read this before, you're not wrong. God tells these very words to Joshua as he's about to enter the promised land. See what Baldwin J.G., uh, uh, one of the commentators of the book of Haggai, Zechariah and Malachi, says this about this particular verse. He says, Be strong was the command repeated many times to, earlier to Joshua and to Israel as they went into the land for the first time. One of these passages, um, Baldwin says, might even have been the theme of the day's meditation at the end of this week during which the events of the Exodus had been commemorated. These words were spoken to Joshua as he was encouraged be be strong, Joshua, for I am with you. And guess what? Who does Haggai direct this verse to? He directs it to Zerubbabel. He directs it to the people listening. But he also directs it to Joshua, the son of Zodadak, um, Josadak, the high priest. It is significant that another Joshua is being spoken to. The very words that the Joshua during Moses' time was being spoken to. We are going to need courage if we are going to face the future. We are going to need courage, friends, to overcome our, our nostalgia to the good old days. And not necessarily bad. We are going to need courage to face all that life has in store for us. As we reintegrate back, we will have challenges that we have not faced before. We will have situations that we have not faced before. And God's courage in us is going to help us navigate around those challenges. But if we are honest, you know, if you are honest, many of us would like uh, would admit, and I would be the first one to admit that walking with God in the unknown is really, really hard. And during those times, they had real administrative, spiritual challenges. They even had opposition, and we're going to have some real spiritual, uh, 
administrative challenges, and even oppositions, sometimes from the very ones we love. How is it possible to be courageous through this all, which brings me uh, to the point of that the, the possibility of courage is, is with us. We can have courage. The silver is mine, the gold is mine, declares the Lord Almighty. The, the glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house, says the Lord Almighty. And it is in this place that I will grant you peace. You see how God is directly speaking to them? So when Nebuchadnezzar came and he destroyed the temple, he took all the artifacts, he took all the gold, he took all the precious jewelry and he desecrated it. And now there is this real challenge, you know, who's going to bring all the silver? Who's going to bring 3,000 tons of gold? Who's going to bring 30,000 uh, uh, tons of silver to make this temple the way it was? And God says the glory of the present temple will be greater than the glory of the past one. We know throughout history that this temple eventually doesn't surpass the glory of Solomon's temple. It in fact remains pretty subdued as compared to the glory of the Solomon temple, the temples that took seven years to build. So what is God referring to when he says the glory of the latter temple, the second temple is going to be greater than the former? What is God referring to? God is saying that there is someone greater than the temple. God is pointing our attention to someone who is uh, greater than the representation that the, uh, that the temple had. What did the temple represent? The temple represented God's presence. The temple represented uh, stability. It represented peace. You know, you see the Israelites could have courage because God's presence was with them. It represented the physical manifestation of God's presence. God tabernacled amongst the group of people. The te temple gave uh, courage to its people and uh, and see what Stephen M. Coleman in his commentary Knowing the Bible says about this he says the physical structures were merely symbols of the true temple that is Jesus Christ who tabernacled amongst us Jesus is the fulfillment of God's presence God's desired temple not because he needs a house to live in but because he created and redeemed his people so that they might worship him in spirit and in truth the temple displayed that God has made a way for sinful men and women to dwell in the presence of a holy God through the blood of a sacrifice and the ministry of a high priest. Someone greater than the temple is here. Jesus is with us. And because he is with us, because he's made us right with God. You see, the temple uh, was a place where people got right with God. Sacrifices were offered so that people could, could be in God's presence. Jesus takes the punishment for the ways in which we, we dwell on the past unhealthily, the way we allow future anxieties to bury us, the way we sort of give in to fear and anxiety. Jesus died for us on the cross so that he can make the presence of God accessible to us. You see how we can find courage, friends? The personal presence of God in us is the reason we can have courage. God is not just with us, as he said, he is now in us and that spirit in us the spirit of god in us is the source of our courage is the source of our strength that's why why do you think the pharisees were upset when jesus said destroy this temple and i'll raise it up in three days they said hey it took so many days to build this temple and you're going to raise it up in three days but they forgot that he was talking about his body because someone greater than the temple was amongst their midst jesus didn't need a temple because god doesn't dwell in in, in temple made by human hands because the whole earth is his. That's what he's telling the Israelites, right? He, he's telling them, the silver is mine, the gold is mine, the sun will not harm you by day, the moon will not harm you by night. I hold the whole world in my hand. So friends, I know some of you may be feeling discouraged today, some of you may be feeling overwhelmed today. You know, I want to encourage you, let's not give up. Let's not give up our dreams, let's not give up our hopes of rebuilding our lives back. Many of us have have dreams about seeing our city, uh, you know, be beautiful, you know, rebuilding our city, rebuilding our nation. And maybe some of us have given up on those dreams as we think about economies collapsing, as we think about all kinds of chaos that is getting unleashed. God is with us. His presence in us is the source of our courage. And we can be, we can face our fears, we can face our anxiety. We're not called to be fake and pretend that life is normal. Yes, we're called to acknowledge our fears and anxieties. We are called to know that because He is with us, 
the glory of the present house will be greater than the glory of the latter house. You see, God is able to make his dwelling in us because of Jesus. You know, God lives in us now and his personal presence in us is the source of our courage. If you're feeling discouraged today, I, I hope and pray that God encourages your heart. I pray that you remember that the Hebrew word for courage, you know, kazak, it's, it, it's, a, it's an ongoing journey, it's, it's a strengthening, you know, courage doesn't mean that we are, we pretend that we don't have any fears, courage doesn't mean that we just show some bravado, courage means that we, we face our fears, but there's a force that helps us work through our fears, there's a force that helps us process our fears in the light of, of God's great good news, you know, Jesus' gospel healthily informs our fears that our anxieties and our insecurities don't have their final word on us. But God's grace and His love towards us enables us to overcome any mountain that life throws at us. And this prophecy that God is speaking right now to Haggai, yes, it gets fulfilled, it, it, it begins its fulfillment through the life, death and resurrection of Jesus. But ultimately God promises us that one day Jesus returns to rule and reign. Uh, you know, he, he, he makes the world as it was meant to be. He shows how life was meant to flow from a place of love and security. And we, even as we wrestle through our fears, even as we wrestle through this, because we're going to constantly have this journey of being strengthened, of, of working through our fears, we look forward to that day when all our fears will, will, will be wiped away, all our insecurities will melt in the presence of His grace. But until we do that, we hold each other's hands and we, we, we sort of look at our new normal knowing that God is with us and we together build what God wants us to build. I want to pray for us today, especially those of us who are, are fearful right now. Especially for those of us who are riddled with anxieties. I know I need prayers in that area. I want to pray for us and wherever you are, I, I believe and I pray that God is going to meet with you. His good news speaks a better word over you. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, even as people are listening to this right now in their living rooms, uh, in their houses, in their homes, I ask that your presence will minister to them. Even as you encourage the people of Israel, be strong, be courageous. I ask that you would encourage us. Be strong and be courageous for I am with you. I am in you. And I am going to see you through no matter what. May that fill our hearts today. May we not unhealthily dwell too much on the past and may we not be crippled by the anxieties of the future. But may your strength help us redemptively look at the past and hope towards the future as we navigate around the challenges of the present. In Christ's name I ask. Amen. So friends, I uh, hope this was uh, meaningful to you. We will now spend some time um, reflecting on this. And I, I would take this time to really write down some of the things in the past that you could be tempted to dwell on, some of the things about the future that you worried about, write it down and begin to see how the good news of Jesus speaks into those fears and anxieties. This is a great time to even plug into a small group and talk to some of your small group leaders who will help you process through either the anxieties and the pain of the past or the worries of the future. Stay blessed and let's spend some time reflecting on God's goodness.
So as we heard Jim it really unpacked to us as to what does true courage really look like in such hard times and and what is the true source of courage uh for us to uh engage with I would like for us to uh take time uh and and and, and answer these three questions you know um number one uh what are some of the events or things from your past that you unhealthily keep focusing on uh take some time to dwell on that uh number two what are some anxieties of the future uh that you keep anticipating and wrestling with uh that keep you again from living a full and wholesome life um take some time to maybe talk to somebody in your small group or somebody who is really close to and process that really unpack that and see what god is really revealing to you from um these positions and and finally once you do that uh how does the good news of jesus um his personal presence uh in your life specifically give you courage to face those fears and anxieties um so take some time to really process these thoughts um put them down prayerfully see what the holy spirit reveals to you and hopefully that gives you a whole new perspective uh in life to take on these challenging times up ahead um all right uh, we are almost at the end of our service um uh in a in, in a short time we are now going to break bread uh with our respective uh small group slash micro group so if they haven't yet sent you a link now is a good time to text them again uh to do so um and um also if you've liked what you've seen uh and if you haven't hit subscribe already do so it's that little button below um wh where you're watching <laughs> right now um and finally um we just want to say we're really grateful you know amidst all this chaos and confusion that we get to do this alongside with you um so so please stay safe uh take all the precautions necessary uh and we shall see you again next sunday at the same time take care